countless books have been written on the history of America. Her people's desire for independence and freedom, the founding fathers, and one of the greatest documents ever created, the Constitution for the United States of America. What is barely known and commonly unreported, however, is who and what exactly influenced and inspired the Founding Fathers to create a revolutionary system based on a natural rights for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. If we want to truly understand what helped to shape their thinking, we must look to the people who were here before all others. It was the Iroquois Confederacy that gave rise to the first federal constitution on the American continent. That constitution, the Great Law of Peace, provided for federalism, separation of powers, equitable distribution of wealth, accountability of elected officials, freedom of assembly, speech and religion, and a system of natural rights that influenced thinkers like Benjamin Franklin, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and Frederick Engels. The influence the Great Law had on the United States Constitution has only recently been acknowledged. In October 1988, the United States Congress passed concurrent resolutions acknowledging the contribution of the Iroquois Confederacy and the Great Law to the development of the Confederation of the Original Thirteen Colonies and the United States Constitution. Previously, the connection had at best been ignored, at worst it had been distorted and suppressed. Admitting that native cultures had participatory governing structures that influenced the Founding Fathers is in stark contrast to the supposedly unbroken line of political and intellectual influence generated by Anglo-European men. Therefore, it was not in the best interests of male American historians and politicians to admit the influence of an egalitarian communal system where women controlled the economics, property, government, and structure of the society. 1744, when Six Nations was presiding over a, a meeting in Lancaster, Pennsylvania about land as usual, you know, the colonies, and Six Nations was pre presiding because all the land was Indian land. We were trying to protect the interests of our people, the nations, the land. So they were squabbling between themselves, the colonies, and one of the Onondaga chiefs stood up and he said to them, you know, you people never going to amount to anything until you learn how to work together. Why don't you make a union like ours, the principle of peace? That's the principle of our peace, equity, to be fair to everybody, and to be united. We're the first United Nations, Iroquois, way back, based on the woman side. The women are in charge of the clans. We have five leaders, clan mother, principal chief, deputy, faith keeper man, faith keeper female. That's our, in every clan, they have duties. Her duty is to find those leaders. So it's the clan mother that chooses the leader. But it has to be ratified by consensus by the clan and then ratified by consensus by the council chiefs, and then finally ratified by consensus by the Six Nation Confederacy. So you just don't walk in there. And in 1775, then, when we met the speaker for the Continental Congress, said to us at that time, in 1744 in Lancaster, you advised us to make a union like yours. We are now taking your advice. That's where your United States started from. You don't know that. You haven't been told that. It's not in your history books, but it's in the history. It's in the congressional records of the United States. It's not figment. It's written down word for word what they said. We're going to make a union like yours based on peace, equity, union. Perhaps the most remarkable feature of the Great Law was its recognition of the status of women by the Iroquois Confederacy. Approximately one-fourth of the Great Law's clauses recognized the power and influence of women in the Iroquois culture. While Franklin and the Founding Fathers borrowed liberally and literally from the Great Law in theorizing about and framing the American model, no reference to universal suffrage or the rights of women appeared in the United States Constitution as originally written. 
It was not until the passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920 that the United States Constitution recognized women as sentient citizens with an ability to exercise the vote. United States courts, taking their cue from the Constitution, had regarded women as merely the property of their husbands, fathers, and brothers. Seth Newhouse, a Mohawk, transcribed the great law which had been passed down orally from generation to generation. The government structure of the Confederacy is marked by a system of delegated authority that flows upward through the system to the leak council of clans rather than downward and evinces shared liberty and responsibility for all members. As Lewis Henry Morgan, the father of American anthropology, observed in his 1851 study of the Iroquois, with the departure of the individual, every vestige of Indian sovereignty vanishes. Fifty sachems make up the League Council of Clans. Each tribe casts a unit vote in the council through its sachem. The Mohawks and Senecas were designated the Elder Brothers, the Cayugas, Oneidas, and Tuscaroras the Younger Brothers. The Onondagas became the firekeepers of the Confederacy, completing the government with separation of powers and checks and balances. Cadwallader Colden, who published the first English language account of the political system of the Iroquois in 1727, wrote, Each of these nations is an absolute republic by itself, and every castle in each nation makes an independent republic, and is governed in all public affairs by its own sachems or old men. The authority of the rulers consists wholly in the opinion the rest of the nation have of their wisdom and integrity. They never execute the resolutions by force upon any of their people. Honor and esteem are their principal rewards, as shame and being despised their punishments. Their great men, both sachems and captains, are generally poorer than the common people, for they affect to give away and distribute all the presents of plunder they get in their treaties or in war so as to leaving nothing to themselves. There is not a man in the ministry of the five nations who has gained his office otherwise than by merit. There is not the least salary or any sort of profit annexed to any office. The council bestows great rights, privileges, and duties upon the Iroquois through enduring constitutional mechanisms, such as equal representation of the tribes and a rule of unanimity in matters of the law. The powerful status of women pervaded Iroquois society. According to the Great Law, clan mothers selected and confirmed the Iroquois sachems and war chiefs. Not only were the clan mothers of each extended family responsible for holding title to a chieftainship, they monitored the sachem's conduct closely and would warn a sachem to abide by the Great Law if it appeared he was not proceeding with the welfare of the people in mind. After three warnings by the clan mothers, who nominated him, a sachem would be removed. The clan mothers also had great influence with warriors. Women could support or disapprove the wisdom of a war party. If a clan mother forbade the departure of a war party, neither the sachem nor the council could object. The women had entire control of affairs. The Great Law not only elevated and embraced the status of women, but also secured the natural rights of the people as a whole. Among the admirable aspects of the Iroquois system was the council's system of checks and balances, which resulted in unanimous decision-making. Disputes were remanded for solutions. An issue would be debated by the Mohawks and Senecas, then referred to the Oneidas and Cayugas, and the decision would then be passed on to the Onondagas, who were the firekeepers for their opinion. If affirmed by unanimity of the tribes, the motion would carry. The Lords of the Confederacy were constitutionally required to serve at the behest of the people while showing endless patience. As stated in their constitution, their hearts shall be full of peace and goodwill, and their minds filled with a yearning for the welfare of the people of the Confederacy. Neither anger nor fury shall find lodgment in their minds, and all their words and actions shall be marked by calm deliberation. The Iroquois, according to former U.S. Commissioner of Indian Affairs John Collier, brought out a social institution, a system of greatness of human relationships, a system for evoking maximum genius and for socializing it, and a role of women in society which well may stand today as the most brilliant creation in the record of man. Then from a world unknown, a ravenous race swept in a dark age for the native life which was hurled into the pit by cannon by rum, by money, and by unconscionable intrigue. 
If the tenets of equality that so pervaded the Iroquois Great Law had been adopted by the American legal system or overlaid onto the existing common law framework, the status of women in colonial America would have been radically altered. In the English common law system embraced by the colonies, women were not considered persons or citizens. Correspondingly, women were disenfranchised and thereby precluded from directly changing their own conditions. It has been noted that the subjugation of women at early common law was not entirely dissimilar from the way slaves were treated. Unlike the co-equal status of women in the Iroquois society, women under Anglo-American common law were relegated merely to roles of production, reproduction, maintenance, consumption, and acculturation in the home. At common law as developed from Blackstone's commentaries, a woman merged her legal identity into that of her husband when she married. She could not sue, be sued, enter into contracts, make wills, keep her own earnings, or control her own property. Married women were civilly dead. Although the Great Law's ethical and governmental structures influenced the Founding Fathers and a number of American men, the status of women in Iroquois society left no indelible imprint on their own domestic relations or the documents that would shape the American government. Of the Founding Fathers, Franklin and Jefferson had the most contact with the matriarchal Iroquois society and were greatly influenced by the ethical edicts and complex government of the League. The sentiment of the Founding Fathers is perhaps most accurately presented in the American changes to the English common law, which included recognition of a wife's right to share her husband's home and bed, a right to be supported by her husband even if he abandoned her, and a right to be protected from a husband's violence. But women were denied the right to sue in court. Thomas Jefferson, who had dealings with the Iroquois, corresponded with Handsome Lake, a Seneca chief. While Jefferson expressed admiration for many of the accomplishments of the Iroquois, he was inexplicably unaffected by the status of women in his society. People like John Stuart Mill fought for women's equality, as we have seen Thomas Paine did also. However, while the Iroquois influenced Enlightenment thinkers on a plethora of ideas, its philosophical proponents ignored the status of women in Iroquois society. Benjamin Franklin probably had the most far-reaching interaction with the League. At a treaty conference between the British and Iroquois in 1744, Franklin sat around the Iroquois council fire with the Iroquois sachems. Franklin's early writings and publications indicate that his interactions with the Iroquois influenced his concept of federalism, natural rights, and the role of man and property in society. At the same time, Franklin was shaping his thoughts about an American federal union of the colonies in which each state would govern its own internal affairs and a confederated government would oversee common external matters. Using the language of the day, Franklin wrote the following in a letter in 1751. It would be a very strange thing if six nations of ignorant savages should be capable of forming a scheme for such a union and be able to execute it in such a manner as that it has subsisted ages and appears indissoluble and yet a like union should be impracticable for ten or a dozen English colonies to whom it is more necessary and must be more advantageous. In 1754, the colonists met with the Iroquois at Albany, New York. The purpose of this Albany conference was twofold, to cement a British Iroquois alliance against the French and to formulate a plan of union for the colonies. After two weeks of debate, the colonists voted unanimously to support a colonial union based on Franklin's principles. The ratified plan for unification bore numerous similarities to the Iroquois structure. In each system, one state could veto the action of the entire body. Unanimity was required. The colonies were to have a grand council capable of choosing its own speaker. Like the Iroquois system, the plan endorsed a unicameral legislature, unlike the bicameral British system that was eventually adopted. Franklin's plan, prescient though it was, died in the colonial legislatures because states feared losing autonomy. The Crown vetoed the plan, believing that it gave the colonies too much freedom. The failure led Franklin to remark that the councils of the savages proceeded with better order than the British Parliament. Franklin and Jefferson, however, did see in the Iroquois a happy mediocrity that embodied the visions to which Enlightenment thinkers aspired. 
Ideally, Franklin saw a virtuous order that would combine the best of European art and literature and the natural rights inherent in an Iroquois system, yet would remain unburdened by over-civilization. Both men believed that an Iroquoian-style culture provided more opportunity for happiness than a European model. Both men admired the fact that leaders of the Iroquois held their positions to serve the people and were readily retractable for failing to do so. Both preferred the Indian attitude towards the possession of private property. Indeed, for Jefferson, the natural, inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness expounded in the Declaration of Independence were paramount as contrasted to the philosophy of John Locke, who advocated life, liberty, and property. As Jefferson wrote, I am convinced that those societies such as the Indians, which live without government, enjoy in their general mass an infinitely greater degree of happiness than those who live under European governments. Jefferson myopically overlooked how pervasive that happiness was, never mentioning the ramifications of sexual equality when discussing the ethical, natural state that bound and harmonized the Iroquois. Franklin, however, was at least cognizant of the role of women in the Iroquois society, acknowledging that women are the records of the council, who take exact notice of what passes and imprint it to their memories to communicate it to their children. Thomas Paine, who traveled to America at Franklin's invitation, sat around Iroquois council fires, learned the language, and tried to negotiate an alliance with the Iroquois during the revolution. He wrote that Iroquois society lacked any of those spectacles of human misery which poverty and want present to our eyes in all the towns and streets of Europe. Payne, unlike Jefferson or Franklin, may have been influenced by the role of Iroquois women, for he was an advocate of women's rights. Two decades after the Albany Conference, Franklin's modified plan turned into the Articles of Confederation. When the Constitution and subsequent Bill of Rights were completed, the influence of the Great Law was unmistakable. Elements of First Amendment free speech, religion and assembly doctrines, provisions for amendment, Fourth Amendment search and seizure protections, federalism, checks and balances, and separation of powers were all firmly rooted in the Great Law. Unlike the Great Law, however, the Founding Fathers rejected equality by embracing slavery and denying suffrage for women, blacks, and non-propertied men. The transition from Iroquois matriarchy to colonial patriarchy Anglo-American male society embraced and codified the subjugation and enforced dependence of women in stark contrast to the co-equal status of women and men in the Iroquois Great Law and society. How could the Founding Fathers generate a constitution so revered for its eloquence and in part modeled after the Iroquois Great Law that lacked recognition of the rights of citizens below the narrowest strata of society at the top of the societal ladder? Why did the opening language of the Constitution, we, the people, ring hollow for so many, so long? Overwhelmingly, the recognized intellectual and philosophical underpinnings of American political thought reinforced patriarchal systems. Of the early Western philosophers who influenced the founders, perhaps Plato stands alone as a proponent of women's rights. Plato's Republic espoused that confining women to domesticity was a waste and that the innate qualities of women could not be known so long as the socialization and education of the sexes were so different. In the language of author and teacher Charlevoix, the Iroquois were entirely convinced that man was born free, that no power on earth had any right to make any attempts against his liberty, and that nothing could make him amends for its loss. It would be difficult to describe any political society in which there was less of oppression and discontent, more of individual independence and boundless freedom. Perhaps it is time to correct the record about the true influence of indigenous knowledge and wisdom on the societal, political, and cultural fabric of America, and integrate these qualities fully into all aspects of our beautiful union. We're more dedicated than ever to provide authentic, truthful, and uncensored information and inspiration. That's why we created the Inspired Community on the free speech platform Locals. There's no censorship, a free flow of information, and it's more personal and intimate. And you can join us as a free member or a paid supporter. Please visit Inspired 
www.dadlocals.com and join us today.